Hola amigos, ¿qué tal? Stuart here from Spain Speaks with the Spain News update and the fallout from the false homophobic attack in Madrid the other day continues to dominate headlines and both the Prime Minister and the Interior Minister have been criticised for their handling of the case. But more about that in just a moment. Firstly, a big thanks to all of the people that left comments on the last video. Lots of comments, lots of debate happening there as usual. Thanks to people that supported the channel by buying merchandise and a big thanks to my patrons on Patreon for your support. Now, let's get into the news, and as I said, the story about a falsely reported homophobic attack in Madrid the other day is still dominating headlines. As we know, a young man reported to police that he was attacked by eight hooded youths because he was homosexual, and they carved a nasty word in his buttocks. But one day later, he told police that it was all a lie, and the SH1T really hit the fan. And a lot of politicians and gay rights activists were left with egg on their faces. However, Prime Minister Sanchez warns that the false accusation in Malasaña cannot cover up the reality that the LGTBI community suffers. Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez warned on Thursday that the false report of a young man who said he had been assaulted in the Madrid neighbourhood of Malasaña because of his sexual orientation cannot cover up the reality suffered by the LGTBI community, such as the increase in hate crimes. This false accusation cannot prevent us from describing what is true, the reality that people of many sexual orientations suffer because of who they are. He said at an event in Gijón, a day after the 20-year-old who reported having suffered a homophobic attack, admitted to the police that the injuries were consensual while he was having sex with another person. Sanchez wanted to show his affection, solidarity and empathy towards this group while reaffirming his government's commitment to continue to put measures and instruments on the table to curb the increase, unfortunately, of hate crimes. So the Prime Minister there on the front foot saying that his government is not going to back down, they're going to continue with the commission into hate crimes, even though the crime that triggered the commission didn't happen. Another politician that is under the pump at the moment is the Interior Minister, Mr. Grande Marlaska, and he's blaming the police for not warning him about the doubts surrounding the false accusation in Malasaña. I found out yesterday, he said. The Minister of the Interior, Fernando Grande Marlaska, has assured Thursday that he will continue to coordinate the fight against the scourge of hate speech, despite the opposition's calls for his resignation, following the false case of homophobia of the young man from Malasaña. As he explained, the police did not report any suspicions suspicions about the complainant's inconsistencies before yesterday afternoon, and the ministry informed him as soon as it became aware of them. So there we go, the Interior Minister saying that he's not going to resign for the way that he handled the case, saying that he didn't know about it because police didn't inform him. And opposition parties here in Spain are having an absolute field day with this case. Now the Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez is making headlines for another reason today, and it is because the government has announced its new vocational training law. As we can see here, Pedro Sánchez presents the new new vocational training law. Our objective is to reach 3 million workers, he said. The Council of Ministers has approved the draft organic law on the organisation and integration of vocational training after receiving the green light from the government. The text will begin the parliamentary process in the coming weeks. The president of the government, Pedro Sánchez, appeared in Asturias to present the draft bill. Sánchez pointed out that the future law has economic resources of 5.5 billion euros. He also indicated that the government, together with the educational community, trade unions and employers, had approved 10 new qualifications, 15 specialised courses, and had committed to creating 200,000 new vocational training places by 2023. So, the government announcing a plan to spend billions of euros on vocational training, and the idea is to turn 3 million of Spain's youth into skilled workers. And let's be honest, it comes at the right time because there are a lot of young people in Spain that don't work, they don't study, and they even have a name for these people, Ninis. And as we can see here, the number of Ninis increased by 16% with the pandemic in Spain, twice as many as in Europe. The economic crisis caused by the coronavirus pandemic hit young people hardest. The slowdown in activity and the destruction of jobs once again hit young people who had to bear the brunt of an unemployment rate of 38%. In addition to redundancies, many young people were unable to enter the labour market after completing their studies. As a result, the number of knee-knees, young people who neither study nor work, rose sharply again to over 17% in the 16 to 29 age group in 2020. It is important to note that these data exclude young people on furlough schemes, as they are still considered employed as they remain contractually bound to their employers. The percentage of young Nini grew by 16% over the course of the pandemic year, and increased double the EU average according to Eurostat figures. This is the first increase in the number of young people neither working nor studying since 2013, that is, since the end of the Euro financial crisis. 
So 38% youth unemployment here in Spain. So let's hope that the government's vocational training plan gets these people into work. Now there's some good news when it comes to the health crisis here in Spain, and it is that Spain is now downgraded to medium coronavirus risk for the first time in over two months. The epidemiological situation in Spain continues to improve day by day. This Thursday, more than two months later, our country has entered the medium risk for coronavirus by dropping the cumulative incidence to 140 cases of COVID-19 per 100,000 inhabitants in 14 days. This is an unprecedented situation since the 1st of July. Day by day, the rate of coronavirus infections has been falling since the 27th of July, when the peak of this fifth wave of the pandemic was reached. It was then that the numbers slowed down first very slightly, and from August onwards more sharply. So much so that Spain left the extreme risk for COVID-19 after the weekend of August the 28th, and in less than two weeks has fallen below the 150 that marks the next step of the COVID traffic light. So COVID-19 data in Spain fortunately on the way down. Now let's have a look at a summary of the health situation here in Spain. As we can see that accumulated incidence rate now down to 140. There are still 5,115 people hospitalized around the country with COVID and there are still 1,258 COVID patients in ICU. When it comes to the vaccination campaign we can see that 73.56% of the population have completed vaccination and 78.12% have received at least one Dose. Now Brexit is apparently rearing its ugly head again and according to this headline Brits are being rejected for residency in Spain and given 15 days to leave the country. Some UK nationals who have had their Spanish residency application rejected are being sent notices telling them they must leave the country within 15 days or risk being classified as illegal. Anne Hernández, the head of citizen help group Brexpats in Spain, told the local Spain on Thursday of the most recent residency problems UK nationals in Spain are encountering post-Brexit. According to legal documents the local Spain has had access to, Spain's immigration office, Extranjería, are informing some Britons who applied for residency under the withdrawal agreement that they have 15 days to leave the country after their application has been rejected. You will be advised that, unless you have a qualifying document to stay in Spain, you must leave the Spanish territory within 15 days from the notification of this resolution unless exceptional circumstances occur and you justify that you have sufficient means, in which case you may extend your stay up to a maximum of 90 days, reads the document. Applications are mostly being rejected on the grounds of insufficient evidence of legally residing in Spain in 2020, such as Padron, Town Hall Registration, medical insurance or other proof people were actually living here before 2021, Hernández explained. So there we go, more problems for some British people living in Spain because of Brexit. And in the worst case scenario, given 15 days to leave the country. Now let's have a look at some of the comments from previous videos. One here from Martin. Muchas gracias por el video, Stuart. The price of beer in pubs here in the UK is far too expensive, with the exception of JD Weatherspoons. Weatherspoon is the name of Tim Martin's old teacher, who told the multi-millionaire that he would never achieve anything in life. Yeah, Martin, thanks for the comment. Obviously referring to something that we mentioned the other day, the price of beer, both here in Spain and in the UK. Somebody said that a pint of Estrella Lager in Newcastle, I think it was, costs just under five pounds. And I said that here in Spain, you can get the same pint for around two pounds, a lot cheaper. And to be honest, I don't really know a lot about the JD Witherspoon's empire there in the UK. I know that they have a lot of pubs, of course, but I don't think I have ever been to one of those pubs when in England. But I saw another couple of comments from other people saying that beer in those pubs is actually a lot cheaper than in other places around the country. And another story of somebody who was told by a teacher that they were going to fail in life and they turned themselves into a multimillionaire. One here from Ves Primavera. Dear Stu, I received my third dose of Pfizer on Monday and I am a healthy person. I have done it because my family is with health problems, because I have a risky job every day in a school with 1,200 pupils, plus I travel every month. So here in Serbia, you are allowed to have the third dose after 180 days, no matter if you are in the risky group or not, and you can choose the vaccine. Thanks again for the great videos. Yeah, best thanks for the comment, and a fair bit of difference between Serbia and Spain when it comes to vaccines. Here in Spain, we cannot choose the vaccine we are given. You just go along on the day, and you get whichever one they have, according to your age group, of course. And as far as I know, you can't just turn up at a health centre here in Spain or a hospital and ask for a third dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. Of course, there has been a lot of talk about booster shots for the general population, but the health ministry here hasn't decided 
decided anything on that yet. And as we saw the other day, the only people that are going to get booster shots anytime soon are the immunocompromised. But I'm sure there will be a lot of talk about booster shots here in Spain in coming weeks and months. Want to hear from Judith? When can we say goodbye to masks? Yeah, Judith, thanks for the comment. And the answer to this question is that I have no idea when the government is going to remove the mask mandate here in Spain. Of course, we don't have to wear a mask outdoors, but we have to wear a mask indoors at all times if we go to a supermarket, restaurant or any other public indoor space. The health situation in Spain, as we saw before, is improving. We saw the other day that curfews here in Spain are now a thing of the past, except in one small town down there in Andalusia, and other restrictions are slowly being lifted, but no talk on the mask mandate yet, or at least I haven't heard anything. One here from Chuck about the Spanish airline, as with Alitalia, an American Airlines executive noted as we were entering the situation that it could be five years to return to previous levels of airline travel. That could mean a lot of good money going after a sinking industry. Bailouts are not capitalism. Let the companies fail and let the strong companies feel the need. Yeah, Chuck, thanks for the comment and obviously referring to a story that we saw the other day about how the Spanish airline company Air Europa has already gone through some 475 million euros of bailout money and needs more to stay afloat. And the airline executive that you mentioned there is most likely right and pre-pandemic air travel won't get back to normal for a few more years. And if that is the case, there is serious trouble ahead for some airline companies. So an interesting debate, should the government save these companies or should only the fittest and strongest companies survive. One here from Luke. Hi Stuart, the governmental incompetence is an interesting topic. I can't judge the polls, but I can compare a few countries because I share my time almost equally between Spain, Costa Blanca, Belgium and Switzerland. The difference between Switzerland and Spain or Belgium is huge. Essentially, the Swiss authorities are much better organized and political decisions are taken fast because the opposition doesn't try to paralyze the process every time. In Belgium, political responsibility is scattered among many policymakers. Hence, no one can take a decision. For example, there are nine, nine ministers responsible for health care. In Spain, a lot of useless debate focuses on the political power independence of the autonomous communities. Needless to say that my favourite is Switzerland, but I have to admit that the Spanish sun makes up a lot. Yeah, Luke, thanks for the comment and thanks for sharing your opinions on government incompetence and pointing out the difference between the three countries that you mentioned there, Spain, Switzerland and Belgium. And it does seem that Spain models the Belgian model more than the Swiss model. Although there's not nine people responsible for healthcare in the central government, Spain does have 17 autonomous communities with 17 different health systems. And one of the big problems that Spain had during the pandemic was the way that things were organized differently according to which autonomous community you were in. It was very difficult to keep up with what was going on around the country. And the decentralized process here also makes it difficult for decisions to be taken quickly. But you're right with another thing that you say in your comment, and that is that the sun shines most days here in Spain and it covers up a lot of the cracks. And finally, one here from Martin. Hi, Stuart. Curiously, how long does it take to compile one of your YouTube videos from compilation, editing to publishing? Yeah, Martin, thanks for the comment. It takes a few hours hours to put everything together for one of these videos. It takes me about an hour, hour and a half, sometimes two hours to compile all the information. Then I have to set up the camera, the sound, and put all the information into the iPad. And then the recording starts, which can take anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes, depending on interruptions. Today, you can probably hear somebody banging in the background. Sometimes dogs are barking, planes go overhead, so I have to stop. And I also make a few mistakes when I'm talking to the camera. Editing is about an hour, hour and a half, and publishing is about 20 minutes. So that's the process. On that note, I'll wrap the video up. Questions and comments, please leave them in the section below. Debate the video out as you normally do. Give it a thumbs up if you liked it, thumbs down if you didn't. I'll see you in the next one. Hasta luego.